Let's pray together, okay? Father, we, we are sharing today about you and who you are and all our thoughts, all our desires, all our concepts of who you are. You're way beyond all that. I ask, Lord, that as I share concerning you, the things that are shared, maybe an opening and uncovering of, of a little bit of who you are and the great privilege that we have that we can be in relationship with you. To have a relationship with you through Jesus. My prayer is, Lord, that that would be clear through our sharing together. That your presence would be made known. So we give you our ears. We give you our heart. We give you our tongue and praise. That you would reveal to us something more about yourself that we've never has seen before. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus, amen. I'm wondering, there's a word that we share, and I wonder if we got it up on the screen. And the word is God. When I say the word God, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? What do you think of when I, you hear this word, God? Faithful? God. God. Whatever we as human beings know of God has been revealed to us by him. He's, that's the only way we know, that he discloses himself to us. He's God, and whatever thinking that you thought about God falls so short of who he is. Falls so short. And so I'd like to see if you could read this next word. Can you read that? What do you see in that? Do you see, people can look at that two ways, right? You can read it differently, some of you might have. God is nowhere. God is nowhere. Or you could read it, God is now here. It's a matter of perspective, isn't it? In our life and our relationship with Him, every thought that we might have of God is beyond, He is way beyond. Way beyond. Our thoughts, our intentions, He even says His ways are beyond our ways, or everything. And God is now here. The Bible doesn't argue for the existence of God, but let's see what the scripture says. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. It's interestingly enough... That one verse begins everything. It begins time. Past, present, future begins right there in the beginning. But it's interestingly enough that God, the word God there in the Hebrew is in the plural. The 
plural, God. But notice, I want you to notice something about the verb there, created. The Hebrew verb is bara, which is singular. So you get the impression that maybe God's trying to tell us something about himself in that opening verse. That God is a plurality, a unity, and yet God creates. The word bara is Hebrew. It means creating out of nothing. Creating out of nothing. Everything begins here. The Bible does not argue whether God exists or not. It just starts here with God. There's only two options, by the way. It's either you start with God or you start with something that else is that eternal and you would say may matter or whatever. It has to be eternal. You have to start somewhere. Here the Bible starts with God himself who creates, who takes matter and energy and puts in information and creates. And here you are today. The only other time in chapter 1 in Genesis that speaks of plurality of God is when man is created. Some of you heard this. Let us make man in our image. Let us. And again, the same fra phrasing is God created man in his own image. The same two words are used there. God creates. God creates. So everything that we think of God can fall short. There was an old hymn, and one verse goes this way. Weak is the effort of our heart, and cold are our warmest thought. But when we see thee as thou art, we'll praise thee as we ought. We'll praise thee as we ought, we'll praise thee as we ought. But when we see thee, or you, as you are, we'll praise you as we ought. God is so far beyond us. Anything that we could think or imagine God to be. And some of us, even the images, you know, there's a, there was a little boy, John, Johnny, who was in a, a Sabbath school class. And they were called to draw pictures. And the teacher was to Johnny. Johnny says, what are you drawing, coloring? He says, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, nobody's really seen God at any time. Johnny, you know. Well, he says, after I'm done this picture, I'm going to know what he looks like. <laughs> but that's how we are. As human beings, we create what we think God to be. And now, honestly, that's no different than making an idol out of wood or plastic or metal to be worshipped because it falls sh so short of who God is. God spoke to Moses at the burning bush. And Moses asks, if I go back, what, how would I know? What name should I use in order for the Israelites to believe I've, I've, I've come? And Exodus 3.14 3, says, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am. Jesus picks up this very same phrase when he's speaking to, to his, his, uh, the Pharisees, particularly when, when they were questioning about him giving testimony, that his testimony about himself can't be true. Well, Jesus replies with these words, 
If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day, and he saw it and was glad. You're not yet 50 years old, the Jews said to him. And you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered. Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they wanted to pick up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself and slipped away from the temple grounds. Now, when God uses that name, I am, he's not talking in terms like Popeye. I am who I am, and that's all I am, I'm Popeye. No. He's not saying that. It's a state of being. And what he's saying in that being, I am, that God is self-existent. He's self-sustaining. He's uncreated. He's spirit. Now, let's unpack that for a moment. He's self-existent. God himself has nobody to depend upon concerning his existence. No one. He's self-existing. You didn't make him be. Self-existent. He's self-sustaining. That is, he continues. He goes, never wears out. He's continuing who he is. He sustains. He needs no nourishment. He needs, like we do. He's self-sustaining. And of course, everything else in this, this universe comes from him. He created it all, so he's uncreated. Nobody created God. He's uncreated, but he's also spirit, and spirit has no height, no width, no any direction. You can't measure. You can't measure God. You cannot weigh him. He's spirit. He's spirit, and Jesus is that same God. He is. And he foremost. So God is self-existent, self-sustaining, uncreated spirit. First Samuel 2 2 says this of God: there is no one, no one holy like the Lord. There's no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Peter would say this in 1 Peter, he says, But just as he who has called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And that's a quotation from Leviticus. God's holiness. What does it mean that God is holy? I don't think we get it. I know I don't. Think about it. We use the term holy as as the idea of being separate. Separate from something else. It's set aside. That's holiness. The holiness of God as he is holy is separated from all his created things. Everything. He is pure, without defect, and totally other than we are. In our sin In our sinful nature, God is totally other than that in his holiness. He's separate from us. Hmm. Job 42, 1 to 6 says, Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is this 
that obscures my counsel without knowledge. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God is sovereign. He's the ruler. Not just over his kingdom, but over ours. He is king of his kingdom. He's powerful over life and death. He rules over that which is visible and invisible. And by the way, that's Jesus. He rules. He is sovereign ruler. All these things. When you think in terms of God being way out there high above everything, every thought, everything that we could ever think or imagine about him. And yet, yet how do we have a relationship with that God? How does one human being create it in the image of God, have a relationship with this God who is holy, who is self-existent, who doesn't need us. Nor necessarily have a desire. And yet it's this. 1 John 4, 8, and 16. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. And so we know and rely on the love of God God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And the most probably one that you've got memorized. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that to save the world through him. And whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they do not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. For God so loved. If this love. So how do we approach a God that doesn't need or have a, a want for anything, and yet desires a relationship with his creation, with us. It must be on the basis of God's love for us, for you and for me. He wants a relationship, get that. He wants us to be in relationship with this God that we can't understand, can't comprehend, can be, who's so far beyond us, and yet he wants us to have a relationship with him. And he sends Jesus. It has to be love. His love. See, God's attributes are not what he has, but who he is. He is holy. He is self-existent. God doesn't have love. He is love. It's his nature. 
who he is. And Jesus comes in love, and no one takes his life, but he gave it as a life that's sacrificing himself on our behalf so that he could move into the human heart and transform one's life to become more like him. Someone said he became like us so that we might become like him. Christianity, of all the, the belief systems in the world, Christianity is the only one that has God himself taking up residence in the human heart. Think about it. All the different religions upon this planet. Christianity talks about Jesus moving in in his spirit into the human heart and the, our bodies become the temple of God. Only Christianity. He moves into our lives because of the sacrifice he made. The wrath of God was poured upon Jesus, not upon us because of our sin and our sin nature. But Jesus died on the cross, taking God's wrath upon him that we deserved. And the Bible says that that is love. This is how we know love, that Jesus laid down his life for us. Christianity is the only one that God moves into humanity on the basis of faith to forgive, to transform, and to empower to become more like Jesus. That can be a little scary. Huh? What if we took that in reality, and believing that the Holy Spirit, God has moved in, the Trinity has moved into your heart and life, the center of your body, your heart, the core of who you are. What if we took that seriously? As he says, this God who is all-powerful is the I am. I am. There's one song we sang already this morning in the early. He is the one who was and is to come. He's the one who lives in us, the great I am. The great I am. who's so far beyond us, and he comes and he gives himself on, on the basis of the sacrifice of Jesus to say, okay, I'll exchange your life for mine. And he's promised to come and move into our lives. And my, my sense is that we take all of that deeply for granted. That we do not know the scope, the height, the depth, the width of his love for us to say, I want relationship with us. So the, everything I've, what I've created in my image desire relationship and my question for you is do you recognize that for when God looks upon us Jesus came into the world to save not condemn to save us in love so we could have a relationship with a God who's so holy that if without that, 
we could stand before God, we'd be struck down in a moment. Let me illustrate that. In the Old Testament, there is a Day of Atonement. Particularly in the Day of Atonement, Jews are practicing it today. But during the time of the tabernacle and the, the temple, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would, what would he do? He'd enter on that day into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God was there on the mercy seat. And what did he have to do? He had to wash himself up. He had to sacrifice an offering for himself first. He puts on the clothing. He has these little bells on the bottom of the thing, and they tie a rope around him. And he takes blood into the Holy of Holies, and he goes in, and you can hear the jingling, of the bells. And they're listening outside. He stands before the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God there, and he sprinkles the blood on the mercy seat. Now the thing is, he's got to get this very well, correctly. Because to enter before a holy God like that, without knowing that he is confessed up, or that he has this relationship based upon the sacrifice saying, thank you, thank you God for the sacrifice that you cleanse, you have done it. If he hadn't done that, and he stood before God, and he goes to sprinkle it on the mercy seat, and he goes, wait, dead. That's why the bells, you know, and the rope. If he falls over dead in the Holy of Holies, they know to pull him out because they're not going in there to get him. Not with the presence of God. And we don't get that, do we? Without Jesus, we couldn't stand before him. Because God is so separate from us, so high. But because of Jesus, we could stand before this holy God, this God who doesn't need anything, and yet desiring relationship with us because of Jesus, we could stand before him, and he looks upon us, and he doesn't see us. He sees Jesus. So what about you today? Ever thought of any of these things at all? Have you thought about any of that? What God has done. And maybe Terry, he's whispering. God's speaking. The question is, is are, am I truly hearing him speak? Because God is now here. 